right, well, good morning. Good morning. Wait, wait. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I'm not connected. It's really a wireless mic. How about this one? Just go ahead. Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see all of you today. We are thrilled that you are joining us in person at 130 Piedmont Road. For those of you who are at home, you are welcome. We have space for you, and we'd love to see you here. So um, it's thrilling that we get to spend this hour and a half together. That's right. So we'll stall as long as possible for everyone watching online to get yes, down here. 130 Piedmont Be Road, guys. Because it's a way better experience it in is. person, isn't it? Yes. That's right. That's right. You are well, welcome. listen, if you're a guest with us, or maybe you have a prayer request, there's a communication card in front of you. It, it also has a space on back for you to write some prayer requests in. Uh, you can place it into the offering box in the back in the lobby uh, on your way out. But if you're watching online or you're just really cool and you like to do tech stuff, use your smartphone and take a picture of that and it'll bring up our communication card. We love just to be in touch with you. I probably send one or two emails a week yes. just to encourage you, get you through the week so we can see you back on next Wednesday or Sunday, uh, but uh, sign up for with our um, sign up with that QR yes. code or I'm sorry that QR code oh, or <laughs> with the connect card in front of you so that we can get in touch with you. All right, and this announcement is for all you ladies. It is happening this week, Thursday at 6:30 p.m. in room 205 to my left, your right. You're going to want to join us every Thursday where we are going to begin our women's Bible study for this season. We are going through Angela Thomas Parr's book, Brave, and it is a timely book for us at this time in 2022. So we will also have a, a Zoom connection so that for those of you that are home, you can still participate and watch the Bible study videos, but there is nothing like being with ladies and praying with each other and spending time with each other. Again, did I say 130 Piedmont Road, room right. 205? So join us every Thursday, 6.30 p.m. That's right. Guys, set your calendar for February 5th, Saturday morning at 8 a.m. in our multi-purpose room. We're going to prepare a great breakfast for you, but also Pastor Joseph's going to be bringing the devotional that day. So you're just going to, it's a great time to be encouraged, to get to know the other men within the church because we've just got some time to fellowship, but also to, as the Bible says, iron sharpens iron. We get together and we, we go, uh, we look into God's word. And so I want to encourage you guys um, on February 5th, 8 a.m. here in the multi purpose room. And we can't let January go by without saying happy birthday to all you January babies out there. So happy birthday to Liz, Rosita, Elena, Dan, and Elijah. So big happy birthday to all, only five of you. All right. Yeah, <laughs> March right. is a pretty big month. So God's, be on the lookout. God's favorites <laughs> are is. born in March. That's right. That's right. Anyways, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All you March babies say amen. <laughs> that's right. And it's the third Sunday of the month, so that's our mission Sunday. Uh, and this is such a great opportunity that we can help see the gospel go to the ends of the earth. We may not physically be able to go to the ends of the earth, but by supporting the missionaries uh, that we support here at Calvary by giving an, an added offering on this Sunday, you can make sure that the gospel goes to the ends of the world. And just let me list real quick. We've got missionaries in the Arab world, in Eurasia. Uh, uh, the Philippines, the Caribbean, and they're not on vacation. They're really no. bringing the gospel. Yes. Trust me. They're yes. great people. Uh, West Africa, Argentina, France, uh, North, Northern Asia, Poland, Taiwan, Ecuador. Then we also support local uh, U.S. missions, uh, Chi Alpha at University of Pacific, uh, Campus Crusade in SoCal, yes. uh, missionaries to ministers, that's our favorite, Shane and Marty Couch, uh, <laughs> Chi Alpha at Stanford, uh, we're making sure they get the gospel as well as an education there. Yes. We even support any motorcycle people on here, you love motorcycles? Secret what? Two of them. Well, thank you. You're going to be really happy because we're supporting a motorcycle ministry uh, so that bikers come to Jesus. Amen? 
Uh, we're supporting a Russians ministry, a refugee immigrant student ministry in Sacramento, and a disaster relief uh, part uh, in Northern California that go all yes. over the world, uh, and, and specifically in America, wherever there's a national disaster, they go in and they help, but they also bring the gospel. Amen. And so it's a great opportunity to give. And speaking of giving, if you're looking for an easy way to give your tithes or offerings or your missions at Calvary, you can simply take a picture with your smartphone of that QR code. Uh, you, it'll take you to PayPal, the Calvary website, PayPal, and you can give your uh, missions offering or your regular tithes and offerings there. It's safe, it's secure, and it's swift. I was thinking of an S word. I wanted to make sure I had three. Uh, But if you're like, you know, I'm old school. I kind of like old school. It's been working for me. I want to put money into an envelope or a check into an envelope. Uh, Susan knows how to process checks still. And so you can place that offering into the back wall in the lobby uh, at any point in the service uh, that is available to you. Amen? Amen. Well, would you stand with me? Let's invite the Lord this morning. And uh, the closing verse that we had on our announcements was Psalm 147 seven verse one. It says, praise the Lord for it is good to sing praises to our God for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity that we have to come together as the body of Christ. We may be few in number, but we're mighty in spirit today. God, I thank you as the commander of the Lord's army. God, we come before you this morning to lift up your praise. So God, we welcome you into this place as our praises go up. God, I pray your presence come down and meet each one of us here. So God, intersect our life this morning, wherever we are. God, I help us to, this morning, to clear our mind of everything that we have to do and to focus on you to give you the praise that is due your name. It is good to praise the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, with streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. Whoever darkness clothes in Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name. Shining down on me When the world's all as it should be Blessed be your name Blessed be your name On the road I'm marked with suffering Those pain in the offering Blessed be your name Blessing you pour out, i turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, Jesus. Take away, you give and take away. My heart will choose to say, 
Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give.
see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only praise So we pour 
It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, He's my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh. You are good, you're good, and oh, you are good, you're good, and oh, for you are good, you're good, and oh, you are good, you're good. Let the King of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, He's my song. Let the King of my heart be the fire. You're good, and oh, 
God, you are good. You're good. And oh, again, he's good. You are good. You're good. And oh, you are good. You're good. And oh, you are good. You're good. And oh, yes, you are good. You're good. And God, you are good even when life is not. God, you're good even when circumstances are bad. God, you are good no matter what we're going through. Our circumstances don't change who you are. But God, that gives us, because of who you are, we can anchor ourselves to you and weather every storm that comes our way. And so God, we rebuke the lies of the enemy that says our end is near. We rebuke the lies of the enemy that everything is bad. God, I pray this morning that you'll help us to look past the clouds and see your sun shining. God, I pray this morning that you will uh, invigorate us with faith. That no matter what we're facing, no matter what's in front of us, we understand that, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, God, this morning, we know the enemy has plans for us, but we know you have plans for us. You have plans to prosper us. You have plans for a hope and a better future. And so, God, this morning, help us to anchor ourselves to the right rock. Help us not to anchor ourselves to the lies Help us not to anchor ourselves to our circumstances, but God, help us to anchor ourselves to you so that we can overcome whatever it is that we're facing. And God, remind us this morning that you are a supernatural God, that you're able to supersede our natural obstacles, our natural suffering, our natural uh, pitfalls that are meant to destroy us and to turn them around to make something beautiful out of them. So God, this morning, wipe away our discouragement, wipe away our doubt, wipe away, God, our lack of faith this morning, and help us to turn to you in our time of need, because you are faithful to the very end. So God, we love you this morning. Now, God, we ask that you would send the Holy Spirit here, God, to give us understanding. God, I pray this morning, give us your mind today that we can understand what your word is saying to us. So God, we thank you for this time and opportunity to come together to worship you, to be in your presence, and now to build our faith so that we can overcome everything that lays ahead of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give the Lord a praise this morning. Come on. Well, I'm grateful for our worship team. If you were here with us on Tuesday, I have a greater appreciation for what it means to lead worship and to uh, use your gifts for the Lord. So can we give a hand for our team this morning? They are. They are the best. Well, this morning we're continuing in our series, Supernatural, and we're looking at how faith unleashes the supernatural in our life so that no matter what we're facing or what we're up against, we have the upper hand. As God's people, we have the upper hand. We just need to hold fast to his hand no matter what things look like. No matter what the enemy whispers to us about our future, we know that God has plans and those have been written. And so we know that we can trust God's plan and his purpose for our life. But there's one fact about life that doesn't change whether you're a, a, a follower of Jesus or you're not. And it's this. Adversity and persecution and suffering are unavoidable in this life. They're unavoidable. There's, there's no way we're going to go through this life without dealing with some persecution, without dealing with some adversity, and without suffering. There's no way we're going to go through it. But God is able to redeem those moments. God likes to show up in those moments in order to show off. He likes to show up in those moments in order to show us that we're not alone and that he is with us. So it can sometimes feel, though, that being a Christian uh, tends to be a magnet for these type of experiences, right? 
Sometimes it feels like that as a Christian, I just, I'm a magnet for adversity. I'm a magnet for suffering or I'm a magnet for persecution. But we are not alone when we face these moments. The Bible states that we have been given everything we need to live a godly life. By faith, everything you need to overcome, everything you need to be set free, God has provided through, to you through his son Jesus so that you can be an overcomer. And as we've been uncovering in our series, living by faith produces supernatural results when we're encountering adversity or persecution or even suffering. And know this, that there is not an obstacle that you or I will face that can keep God's will from being done in your life. There's nothing in this world that can prevent God's will from unfolding in your life. But here's the difficulty about God's will. Knowing what it is. Knowing precisely what God's will is in any given situation can be a challenge because Isaiah makes it very clear that his thoughts are not our thoughts. And his ways are not our ways. And so a lot of times our difficulty in understanding God's will in the moment is we have our plan and our timeline and God laughs because God has something different in store. But nevertheless, the Bible's filled with many examples of when God supernaturally intervened on behalf of his people. And know this about the supernatural activity of God that it doesn't nullify our participation. Just because God can doesn't mean that he's going to maybe pull back the throttle in order to involve us in what he wants to do. And so understand that uh, the supernatural is activated by our trust and our obedience to him. And as we're going to learn from our text this morning, that sometimes obedience will take us all the way to the fire before God shows up. See, last week we read about King Jehoshaphat's surprise attack from three nations. And although his first reaction in that moment was fear, he immediately turns to God in prayer. And he calls for a, a time of prayer and fasting uh, over, through the whole nation. And then God speaks through the prophet, affirming to the people that the battle belongs to God, that he will fight for them. And so we read in our text that as the people gathered together and they prayed and they fasted, uh, they went out into battle as God instructed. But King Jehoshaphat puts the worshipers in front of the army and, uh, and prepares them to begin to sing. And the Bible says that as soon as the worshipers began to praise the Lord, it caused a chaos among those three nations that had come to attack and they destroyed themselves. God fought for his people. At times, many of the times, God's methods may appear unusual, but it's because they're supernatural. See, our natural minds can't understand God's timing and can't understand how God will come through because it's supernatural and we're natural beings. Well, last or two weeks ago, in week one, we read about how Joshua, who is leading the people, uh, into the promised land when he's confronted with an obstacle in the form of the walls of Jericho. And Joshua was an experienced commander of God's army, of God's people. He knew how to fight battles. He was smart and he was strong and he was bold and he was fearless. But God tells Joshua that he's going to remove those walls in an uncommon fashion. He's going to remove that obstacle in a way that Joshua won't understand, but he'll witness the miraculous take place. And so he instructs Joshua to parade around the city once a day. And then on the seventh day, seven times they're to walk around. And on that last lap, seven priests are going to blow seven horns. And at that moment, all the people were to shout unto God. And immediately, as God uh, promised, those walls came straight down. And God's people had the victory. And as illogical as that sounds... Joshua obeyed God to the very uh, nth degree, and God did what he said he would do. 
And so this morning we will revisit a familiar Old Testament story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their lives are a testimony of God's supernatural intervention and how we can live faithful to God even in an ungodly kingdom or nation. See, in the story of the three, these three Hebrew boys, we learn several important truths about godly living. See, they developed disciplines from a young age that prepared them to stand even when their faithfulness was going to be tested by fire. And our main text will demonstrate the supernatural intervention and activity of God and the significance of unwavering devotion amid trials and unfavorable circumstances. Now in Daniel chapter 3, let me just surmise the beginning of the story. We're told about King Nebuchadnezzar, who was very self-absorbed and loved himself, very narcissistic. You have to be when you build a statue 90 feet tall of yourself. Uh, first of all, there's, there's a, some counseling necessary there, but he builds this statue, and it's gold-plated. and So it's not solid gold, but it's gold-plated. And that reminded me of a story this week that when um, Delia and I were getting married, we were going back in, I think, after our wedding to get her uh, engagement ring and her ring soldered together. And we went into the jeweler, and as the jeweler is helping us, another customer comes in, and it's these two guys and this young woman. And this guy says to, his, to the jeweler, um, he says, my friend just bought this gold chain, this solid gold chain he was told for 30 bucks from this other jeweler. And he says, I'm telling him that it's gold plated and that it's not. And, he, and his friend is up and down just convinced he got a great deal and he's got this solid gold necklace for 30 bucks. And the jeweler looks at him within two seconds. He tells him this is gold plated and it's probably worth about three bucks. And that's King Jehoshaphat. It has nothing to do with our text this morning, except the fact that Jehoshaphat had this gold-plated statue of himself, and he summons all of his leaders throughout uh, his empire to come together and to show their allegiance to him. He, he, uh, he requests of them to pay homage to this statue by bowing down. The problem, or the issue in our text this morning is that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are part of this crowd. And they've got a decision to make. Yet what separated the, the whole Hebrew nation from the rest of the world at that time, and even in, in a lot of respects today, is that they subscribed to a monotheistic belief system. They had one God, they had a single God, mono being singular, uh, being one, and theistic being God. They served and believed there was only one God, while literally everyone else around them subscribed to a polytheistic, uh, a variety of many uh, gods. And this caused conflict for the Hebrew people. See, a polytheistic system uh, of belief or religious system had a God for everything, for example, they had a sun god, and then they had a moon god, and then they had a fertility, a fertility god. They had a god of the harvest and a god of sowing. and re They had a god for everything you could think of because it was man-made. And that's what set Yahweh apart, was that he had authority and power over everything. He was able to bring uh, the, uh, he was able to have the rain and, and the sun rise on the good and the bad. He would cause the harvest to grow. He was the God that gave life. Uh, he was the God that uh, was able to strengthen. He could do it all. And so this test that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are facing seemed like it was explicitly designed to entrap them. So the question for them was, would they compromise their faith? No one else would have took issue if the three of them just bowed down and stood back up. No one would have thought a thing because that's what everyone did. And so let's pick up our story this morning in Daniel 3, starting with verse 8. It says, therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to the king, 
to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bag, pipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship will be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, or there, all, there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? This is where it gets good. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But this is great. Listen to this. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury. And the expression on his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven more times than it was usually heated. I got to tell you, in 22 years of pastoral ministry, I have witnessed too many times, time and time again, how a spiritually undisciplined life magnifies trials. I can't tell you how many people I've had come into my office over 22 years who are picking up the broken pieces of their life because of their casual attendance in church, their casual approach to discipleship, uh, and their problems in life were magnified as a result of that. See, James makes it clear that you and I will face trials of various kinds. Jesus said that we would experience tribulation in life. And Paul says in Acts 14 that it is through many hardships that we enter the kingdom of God. But a life built on the word of God and fellowship with the Holy Spirit is designed to overcome every hardship in this life. We may not avoid them, but we have an easier time overcoming them because of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God. And so take note of this. Your daily spiritual disciplines strengthen you to face the many hardships you'll face. It'll strengthen you, and so it's important. This is why we must be committed to reading the Bible and meditating on God's Word. This is why we must have a regular habit of prayer. This is why we must engage in fasting. And this is why the regular practice of going to church as often as we're able to is crucial. See, these disciplines help build your faith to handle every storm that comes your way. Yet those who fall apart constantly or become easily, easily angered are people who live more by sight than by faith. See, the work you put in when everything is tranquil equips you for when the storms begin to rage. And experience has revealed that there is a direct connection between casual discipleship and a life that crumbles under every trial. And so put in the work See, your preparation positions you to respond to difficulties confidently. 
You may still be afraid. You may still feel overwhelmed, but there's a confidence because you've put in the work and you know what your God is capable of doing. See, Joshua was uh, confidently managed the obstacles in front of him because he observed Moses as he parted the Red Sea. And as the Egyptian army was chasing them, he saw God's deliverance because of Moses' faithfulness. He saw how um, God provided through Moses food and water in a desert on their journey to the promised land. He put in the work. King Jehoshaphat, we know, walked with God. He loved God. He knew God's, uh, the law of God. And so when fear approached, he knew exactly what to do. Turn to God. And, and know this, that when the test comes, it's too late to study. When the test comes, it's too late to hit the books because what you've already done is what's going to either help you get through it or not. So do the work now so you can be victorious later. Get up and open God's word. Get up and, and, and put together a regular pattern of going into prayer. And connect with God regularly. Listen, be in church as often as you can because that will encourage you when you're out in this world alone and it's you and God. So in Daniel 3, we're introduced to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who are interesting enough, uh, four Hebrews living in Babylon. And many of us might be familiar with the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, but are we as familiar with their story? See, in Daniel chapter 1, if you were to look back, it informs us how Judah and Jerusalem were, the Bible says, given into the hands of Babylon. Verse 2 of Daniel chapter 1 makes it very clear that it was not a superior army that overcame uh, the Israelites, but it, God handed the people over to Babylon. Now, have you ever read passages and think, God, why would you do that? God, why would you give your people over to such a brutal nation? See, this would happen particularly in the Old Testament after God's many attempts to lead the people back to repentance. After God's many attempts to try to corral his people and, and through the prophets explain to them how they're, where they're going wrong and what they, where they've made the wrong turn to recorrect them after some time, after they refused that, God would eventually give them over, as he will us, to the consequences of our actions. So you and I likewise today have the Holy Spirit who's knocking on the door of our heart saying, uh-uh, you shouldn't be watching that. Uh-uh, you shouldn't be engaging in that relationship. Uh-uh, that's not a good partnership to, to get connected with. The Holy Spirit does that. And he'll keep doing that even once we get a little closer and then a little closer. He'll continue to knock on our heart. And then finally he steps back and he says, well, if I can't help you, your circumstances might wake you up. And that's never a great place to be. See, obedience is not God's way of controlling us. It's his way of blessing us. Obedience isn't God saying, I want you to do things my way and live this way. And if you don't do it, I'm going to. That's not how God operates. God asks us to obey him because his plans, his methods are tried and true. His plans are not to harm us, but to give us a hope and a future. And so obedience opens us up to his blessings. Because without rules or guidelines, we become slaves to our desires by changing their location or changing their name. In fact, Daniel chapter 1 verse 8 explains why it couldn't change them. It says Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. That word resolved is a great word. It means they had predetermined in their mind, we're not crossing this line. It doesn't matter how hot the fire gets, we're not crossing this line. It doesn't matter how much pressure comes against us, we have resolved that we won't defile ourselves. Listen, if you're about ready to take a nap for the rest of the service, I want you to remember that. That when you wake up in the morning, the first thing after you praise the Lord is, God, today I'm not going to defile myself no matter what I face. 
No matter what temptation I face, no matter decisions might be easier on me, God, I'm not going to defile myself. I'm going to resolve myself to honor and obey you. See, a commitment of this level can only be forged in the discipline of pursuing God. It's because their hearts were turned to God. It's because they chose to live in a way that honored God. They were forged with such a resolve. And Daniel says in verse 12 to his Babylonian trainer, he says, test your servants for 10 days and let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. See, the the trainer, this Babylonian trainer, was concerned that if Daniel and his friends who chose not to defile themselves did not eat from the king's table, that one, the king would be insulted. Two, they may look worse than everyone else who's eating the choice food, and that would look bad upon the trainer who would probably lose his life. And so Daniel pleads to him and says, test us in this for 10 days. And he suggests that at the end of 10 days, compare our appearance to those who've eaten from the king's table, and then you decide whether or not we can continue with our dietary ways. Now there's a little golden nugget of truth, a lesson we need to get from Daniel's interaction with his trainer. And although... The issue of defiling himself was extremely severe. It was a serious matter. Daniel didn't make demands or threats. He didn't tell this Babylon trainer. He didn't tear his clothes in his robe and says, God's word says this and I'll never do this. You can't stop me. He didn't put up a scene. He didn't make an argument. He didn't make demands or threats. But he phrased his, uh, his question in a way that gave the trainer an option. And so know this. Your words communicate emotion as much as it does meaning. So your words don't just simply relay meaning of what you're trying to express, but the person listening to you gets an emotion from what you say, and that influences their response to you. So this is a good lesson when you're dealing with hostile people or people who are different than you. Think about how you're saying what you're saying because that can completely change the atmosphere. See, sometimes people reject what you have to say because of the emotion expressed, not necessarily what you're saying. And how Daniel phrased his request gave his overseer an option. See, a demanding tone from Daniel because of his religious rights and how he can't do this would have shut down his request faster than he could have got out the words Yet instead, his request, we learn, is granted. And not only is it granted to him, but everyone who is training with him now goes on his diet. See, God rewards Daniel and his friends with favor. And the scripture tells us they excelled beyond their peers. And so this training that lasted for three years, as it came to an end, uh, verse 19 in chapter 1 tells us how the king comments, Nebuchadnezzar comments, there is none like these four in all my kingdom. God had blessed them so much. God had honored them because they honored God that God elevated them to greater levels as foreigners than those who are natural born Persians. Remember this, God never overlooks your obedience. God never overlooks your obedience. When you're obeying and and you think God's not watching, no, he's watching. He's taking notes. So continue to honor him and he will elevate you. And this leads us to another lesson to learn. And these four Hebrew boys prove that we can faithfully serve God and serve a godless king. Let me rephrase that for us Americans. You can faithfully serve God and serve President Biden. You can faithfully, let me go to the left side. 
Do you can faithfully serve God and serve President Trump? And, and, and Republicans, be quiet right now. We don't need your gloating. You can faithfully serve God and serve those who are against your God and not compromise your faith in God. See, these four Hebrew boys prove this incredible point. See, they faithfully served this polytheistic king who on multiple occasions defied their God, yet God prospered them. God elevated them. They didn't compromise. They didn't make arguments. They didn't get into debates. They just did their job, and they honored God through it, and God prospered them. See, and this is possible when you put God first. Even when honoring God at your workplace, in your relationships, may cost you your position or even cost you your life, God will honor you. See, the moment that devotion to God takes second place to your career, to your hobbies, to your me time, to your comforts or your preferences, you are positioned for compromise. As soon as God, honoring God, takes second place to anything, oh, but I just have to cut these corners because my work and my boss approves this and he needs me to do this. No, no, no. If you honor God, God will honor you and he'll prosper you for doing the right thing. Or you may lose your job. But God will provide you a better one. See, you, you, you put God first because when you don't, you are positioned for compromise. So after three years, these Hebrew boys are somewhere between 17 and 18 years of age. And you would think that their greatest trials are behind them because God has elevated them to such a high platform in this uh, Persian kingdom. Uh, their greatest trials are still in front of them. And so as the instructions are given, back to our text in Daniel 3, instructions are given that as the worship team begins to play, everyone needs to bow down and needs to worship the statue that I've made. And he makes it a point to say, if you don't, you'll be punished for doing so. Now understand this, that uh, punishing through a fiery furnace was a very common uh, uh, point of punishment in the Babylonian empire. Why? Because it was an excruciating way to die. In fact, this hits my top five ways I don't want to die. Wood chippers, number one. <laughs> thank, thank you, Pastor Mark Rentz. Uh, wood chippers is the way I don't want. I don't want to drown, and probably three or four is I don't want to be burned to death. Like, that's a horrible way to go. And so just the, the look of a furnace, just the heat of a furnace, we say, yeah, we'll bow. Oh, we'll bow. That's all right. We'll do this real quick. One, two, three. That's all together. It was an excruciating way to die. And as I mentioned, if these three guys bowed really quick, no one would give a, a second thought about it. If they just went like, so are you okay? Yeah, yeah, just hiccups. I have heartburn. Sorry. Like they could have walked their way around it to spare their own lives because no one would have cared that was around them. In fact, Daniel, we learn historically, isn't at this event and he wouldn't even be there to rat them out. Their family is 900 miles away. No one would know or see what they did. And the cost of not complying, though, was their life. See, these were serious consequences compared to a single moment of compromise. They could have just repented later. Say, God, we're so sorry. We, we didn't know what we are thinking. It's just we don't like fire. And it was hot. We could feel it from here. And so, God, we do. You're still number one. But while you're thinking this morning, how would you respond in that moment? Maybe at work, hey, do this or you're fired. You'll never work in this company or in this industry again. Do this or else. How would you respond? See, at this moment, these four guys or these three guys are going to learn whether they love their life or God more. Do I love my life more than I love God or do I love the God who's given me life and so I can't compromise my belief, my faith in him? See, as their enemies inform 
the king that they refuse to bow, to bow our text tells us that the king is furious with rage. Like one or the other of those is pretty bad. Like rage, oh my gosh, he's really upset. Or furious, that's really scary. I don't, I'm getting the belt when I get home, right? But the king is furious and with rage. Like this is a horrible combination. He is angry at the word that these three guys are the only three not bowing down. And it's interesting because if you read chapter 3, verse 15 correctly, the king is saying, maybe you guys didn't hear the instructions. And maybe you guys weren't paying attention. Maybe there are people talking around and you didn't hear what you need to do. So, hey, band, get ready. We're going to give these guys another shot. And he tells them, listen, the music's going to play again. I just need you to bow down real quick so that everyone can see that you're a part of the team. And, you know, by the way, if you don't, I'm going to have to put you in there because everybody's listening. And so let's, let's try this again. And I love it because their reply is classic. It is wisdom beyond their years. They say, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. What he's saying is, I can't, there's nothing else I can tell you. We can't do this. We won't do this. See, their faith was so strong that we read in our text that they believed God would rescue them. And here's the thing. These young men, these 18-year-olds, have never seen God rescue anyone from fire. They had no idea if God could do this, but they knew God was so big that he was greater than that fire and that furnace that God would somehow protect them and rescue them. Yet, and this is where it gets even better, they state, even if he doesn't rescue us and we die a burning, horrible, torturous, painful death, King, let it be known to you and everyone, we won't worship any other God. Amen. Oh, come on. I'm telling you this morning, that's faith. And that's faith that only can be forged in a life commitment to discipleship and growing closer to God. See, this is exemplary faith, not a conditional faith. There was no conditions to it. You know, how many times, and man, I've said this too many times in my life, but God, if you do this, fill in the blank, then I promise I'll do that. How many times have we negotiated with God? See, that's conditional faith. And God doesn't negotiate the terms of faith. You and I are either all in or we're not. We're all in or we're not. There's no part way in. You're either all in or we're not in. And these three guys were equally devoted to God, whether he saved them or whether he didn't. That's a powerful faith. That's the faith that God is grooming in us. And here's the thing. As we're on our faith journey, God gives us grace because he understands the conflict that we face in growing. But that doesn't, isn't an excuse for us not to grow. So we must do the work because this is the type of faith that God is wanting. His word will produce on us. See, on your journey, you will experience times of suffering for doing what's right. There will be times where honoring God and doing the right thing is going to cost you. It will come with a price. And sometimes the fire will be turned up in your life before you see God come through. Sometimes that fire gets seven times hotter before you will see God show up. You're like, okay, one time, two time, three time, God, any time, four time. Okay, God, it's really getting hot. I'm feeling it from here. Five times, six time. Now God waits until it's at its maximum pressure sometimes before he turns, uh, shows up. And so in the king's rage over their rebellion, He orders the the furnace to be turned up seven times hotter. And he's doing that to make a statement that insolence will not be tolerated. And know this, the king loved these three young men. They They were elevated in his kingdom, but yet he was not going to tolerate this behavior. See, we learn in our 
uh, a little deeper in our text that the fire was so hot that the men uh, that were uh, called to throw them into the fire, as they got near the fire, they died from the heat. But see, it's when they got into the fire, God showed up. See, uh, too many times we're waiting for God to show up as we're walking towards the fire. We're waiting for God to show up as we are uh, being threatened with fire. But God sometimes waits until we're in the fire to show up. And when God shows up, you don't get burned. When God shows up, you don't even smell like smoke. When God shows up, your clothes aren't even singed to the very smallest degree. Because when God shows up and you're in the fire, you're protected. When God shows up and you're in the fire, his will be done. When God shows up and you're in the fire with him, he'll get glory and everyone will find out who your God really is. Yet sometimes God's greatest miracle isn't from delivering us from the trial, but imparting grace and carrying us through it. See, these guys had to go through that threshold of that furnace. They, God didn't spare them from that, but in the midst of that fire, God's grace and God walked with them through their, uh, circum their consequences for doing the right thing. See, by committing to grow spiritually, we deepen our commitment to God so that like these three young men, we don't shrink back when our circumstances become uh, fatal. See, by putting in the work to develop our faith today, we are equipped to stand even if God chooses not to extinguish the storms or in this case, the fire that we're facing. Now look at this. There's, there's a silver lining in your suffering. There's a silver lining in your trials. There's a silver lining in the obstacles and the walls that you have to overcome in order to get to where God wants you to be. There's a silver lining. And friend, this has got to be worth it. This silver lining for you that we're going to close with this morning, it's got to be worth it. Like you can't focus on the pain. You can't focus on the trial. You can't focus on the circumstances. You got to focus on what God is doing because his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. But look at Daniel chapter 3 verse 29 and 30. It says, therefore, after Daniel, Shadrach, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out of the fire, the king says, therefore, I make a decree. This is law. Like this is unchanged. Like the king, once he makes a decree, can't do the opposite of what he's decreed. It's done. It says any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be torn. <laughs> this is so awful. Will be torn from limb to limb, their houses laid in ruin, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. And then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Through their willingness to suffer and even face death. God's glory was so enlarged that the king made a decree that you would be punished to the point of death if you spoke a single word against their God. Listen, you can faithfully serve an ungodly king and kingdom and be godly. You can faithfully honor God even when those around you defy the name of your God. You don't have to speak in defense. God will defend himself. You just keep honoring him through right living and God will work out the details. And so this morning, even if God doesn't prevent the hardship that maybe you're in or you're headed to, Will you still stand? Will you still stand even when God's timing is different than yours? Or will you bow down 
in order to ease yourself of the consequences? Will you endure and make God's glory known and be the reason why others are influenced to serve God even in your pain and disappointment? Will you submit to God's glory over your timing, knowing that God, when he does answer, will come through for you? So never lose hope in God to deliver you. Never lose hope, never stop praying, never stop believing, never stop uh, expecting God to deliver you, but continue to hold tight to him even when he doesn't show up on your schedule. Would you close your eyes this morning? Maybe you're in a fire. Maybe you looked at your options and maybe you've considered how a quick and private compromise might be the easier path moving forward. I believe God has brought you here this morning and has drew you to our online service to encourage you to hold tight to him even when you can't make sense of the circumstances. Daniel and his three friends honored God with everything in them. Yet they were still faced with unfair, unfavorable circumstances that caused them to choose to honor God or to let go of their faith. This morning, friend, understand that God is faithful. God will vindicate you. God will rescue you. And God will restore whatever you've lost and the time you've lost because God is a redeemer and a restorer. And so hold on to him. Father, this morning, we are encouraged by these three young men and their incredible faith to you. God, I pray this morning that we will recommit ourselves to discipleship. We'll recommit ourselves to your word and to prayer and to spiritual practices like fasting and church attendance, that we may position ourselves to grow deeper and closer to you. So when we face storms in life, there's no hesitation as to our answer, or who we will turn to in our time of need. So God, this morning, help us to surrender to you and not our circumstances. Help us to surrender to faith and not our sight. Help us this morning, God, to never compromise, even if it means an easy way out, for you are faithful and you are good. So God, this morning, Do a new thing in us as people and as a church. That through obedient living, you will elevate us. We won't have to elevate ourselves. So God, thank you for this example of these incredible young men. Help us to live our life in such a way that God, you are honored with every decision we make. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. God.